Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, so just a reminder of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, we are going to finish off our introductory module uh, today, which will conclude with embodied uh, cognition. And then we're going to switch from our historical, somewhat philosophical discussion about uh, robotics to almost literally the nuts and bolts of uh, robotics. And we're going to look at three important uh, parts of the final project that you're going to be building throughout this course, three important algorithms that are going to be combined uh, to create your evolutionary robotics experiment, which are artificial neural networks, evolutionary algorithms, and physical simulation. Um, any questions from last time before we dive back into it? So far, so good? Okay. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, assignment two, which hopefully you are working on. Um, as you've seen in the, uh, as you've seen in links from the wiki instructions, there are links into this particular figure. And as I mentioned on uh, the first day of class, eventually this is what you're going to have at the end of 10 weeks. But just to sort of uh, reinforce this idea, you're working with PyBullet, which is a Python, uh, a Python wrapper around the physics engine called Bullet. You're writing a program which is going to become relatively complex by the end of this course called Simulate, which is going to simulate both the virtual environment in which your robot operates and external objects and structures and so on. And also it simulates the robot itself. Um, you're now generating, uh, in assignment one, you generated a virtual world composed of just one object or link. And you used PyroSim to do that. And PyroSim is uh, a second supporting system you're gonna be using uh, in this course. PyroSim allows you to relatively simply define uh, links and joints and sensors and motors and neurons and, and uh, synapses, which we'll get to, and packages them into file formats that the physics engine recognizes. In assignment one, uh, you are packaging your single cube into world.sdf. SDF stands for, uh, stands for simulation descript uh, description format. So uh, SDF files are used in the robotics world for describing or simulating the robot's uh, world. Uh, you then supply that SDF file to simulate and PyBullet takes over and simulates whatever is in world SDF as one or more uh, links. And as we talked about before, a physics engine works by applying forces to objects or links. And based on those forces, it will update the acceleration and thus the new position and orientation of links. And we'll talk a lot more about what the physics engine is doing when we get to lecture uh, six. Okay, so we're going all the way from generating the world to simulating the world using PyBullet. As I mentioned, PyBullet is a Python wrapper around the Bullet physics engine, which is written in C++. For those of you that are interested in the physics engine side uh, of things, you can drill down into the C++ and see what's going on uh, down in the engine room. But for this course, we're not gonna go that uh, that deep. Okay. Um, what you're going to be, uh, what you're doing uh, in part one of assignment two is generating multiple, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up a moment. In uh, assignment one, you're, you're going to be generating multiple links. And then in part two of assignment one, you're going to uh, be, be introduced to a second type of file, uh, a URDF file, uh, which stands for Universal Robot Description File. So it's not complicated. SDF encodes, uh, encodes the virtual environment, and the URDF file encodes everything about uh, the robot. From the, physics engine, from the physics engine's point of view, this, these are all just links uh, and eventually joints. So at the end of assignment two, you're going to be introduced to joints, which again, as the name implies, connects uh, links together. These joints, for our purposes, for the next few weeks, are going to be not unlike your elbow joint or your knee joint. Links connect pairs, uh, sorry, joints connect pairs of links together and constrain how those objects move to one another. If two links are not connected by a link, um, they're free to move and change their relative positions and, and relative orientations, uh, however the forces act on them. Uh, 
but a joint will constrain how objects move to one another. And we're gonna be working with what are known as revolute joints, which are, are gonna allow objects to rotate relative to one another, but not move apart from one another. There are linear joints in Pi Bullet, which are like pistons, which allow objects to move relative to one another, but not change their orientation relative to one another. So in assignment two, uh, you're gonna be uh, introduced to this idea of uh, joints. Okay, um, some of you have already got to that point already, and joints are a little bit confusing in Pi Bullet because Pi Bullet mixes uh, absolute and relative coordinate frames. What do I mean by that? A relative, if you're trying to specify the position of a link or joint, um, in some cases you're specifying its position relative to the position of the link or joint that you're connecting it to. And it can take a while to get that straight, as you'll see in the joints uh, module in, uh, in, um, uh, in Reddit. Uh, I put up some figures there to help you understand the difference between absolute and relative. I know some of you have been working at it already and are still stuck. If you're stuck uh, on that point or any other point in assignment one or two, please do come see me during my office hours, which today will be at 11 o'clock. Any questions about assignment one or two before we push on? All good? Okay, so um, we were working our way through uh, this lecture on uh, embodied cognition, which is this concept very basically s uh, stated, which is that the body is not an obstruction to intelligent action. It is an enabler, it is a tool. It is what allows us to learn how to act intelligently uh, in the world and obviously in many cases carry out intelligent actions. Some aspects of human intelligence seem to abstract away uh, the body altogether. So mathematics, poetry, and chess are just a few uh, examples. And in Western thought, um, these endeavors are often seen as sort of the pinnacle of human uh, achievement, which is again an inheritance of Cartesian dualism, right? Things that are pure mind, pure soul, uh, are somehow better or more reliable uh, or more permanent than things that have to do with the body. Okay. We were looking at this idea of embodied cognition by considering various aspects of intelligence. As Turing mentioned, we may never be able to define intelligently uh, intelligence exactly, but we know some of the things that make up intelligence, and planning is one of them, the ability to see ahead and avoid getting caught in dead ends in future situations. Okay. Uh, obviously, to be good at chess, you have to be able to plan uh, very far ahead, not an easy thing to do. Um, and uh, back in the late 90s, Deep Blue, IBM's Deep Blue computer was clearly a very good planner and was able to beat uh, the, the grandmaster at that time. Using a game tree, which is a non-embodied piece of code that sits inside a computer, well not this computer, but the supercomputer behind this computer, sits in the computer and is non-embodied. Clearly it's a good solution, it does as well or better than, than humans. What is the embodied equivalent of planning? This was actually tackled back in the 1960s. Uh, this is Shaky the robot. This was one of the first robots that was able to not just react immediately to its, its surroundings, but to plan uh, ahead. Um, Shaky was built by the Stanford Research Institute. And this slide is sort of a cartoon, uh, cartoon of how Shaky works. Shaky was a, a technological marvel at the time. As you can see, Shaky has a computer actually on board You'll see uh, there are a couple of wires here, but I think uh, I think these, yeah, these wires are all from one part of Shaky's body to the other. This is a wireless robot in in the 1960s. This was uh, amazing for its time. It's got its computers on board. It has a laser rangefinder so it can detect distance. It's got a camera, an antenna for a radio link. Pretty sophisticated uh, machine. So what does Shaky use its computer to do? Well, the first thing it uses its computer to do is to process incoming raw sensory data from its rangefinder and its television camera. So it's sensing the world. I mentioned last time uh, this basic idea of sense, think, act, which is uh, one half 
of the loop of robotics. So here's uh, Shaky sensing. We, what what does uh, Shaky do when it's thinking? Um, Shaky has sort of two modes of thought. One mode of thought is modeling. So um, now these cartoons are taken from a physics engine. These this was not something that Shaky was doing at the time. But Shaky built up an internal virtual representation of its world. And that virtual representation was basically a virtual version of its world and the various obstacles around it. Shaky was usually told um, to leave the room, uh, get to the door and leave the room. But there are a number of obstacles that Shaky had to sense and plan how to get around. So first of all, it's got to make a model of the world. Then once it has the model, it would run this second program on board, which would plan a route through the obstacles and to the door and allow it to leave the room. Shaky would then move about an inch along this trajectory, come to a halt, and then sense its world all over again. The moment that Shaky moves, the world around it changes relative to Shaky. So Shaky would move about an inch and then sit and think for a couple minutes or a couple hours, depending on what was in the room, move again, stop, model, plan, move, sense, stop, model, plan, move, and around and around you go. Um, you can probably now guess why it's called Shaky, because Shaky would sit there and then sort of jerk in a particular direction and shake to a halt. Okay. Is this how you get around your world? What's the problem with this approach to intelligent action? There are some obvious limitations to this approach and there are some not so obvious limitations. It seems very inefficient, as Logan mentions. It's way too slow. Okay, so Shaky was clearly extremely slow. But again, this is the late 60s. Uh, computers were extremely slow at this time. So part of Shaky's slowness had to do with the fact that it was using extremely uh, uh, slow electronics and computers at that time. Matt says we move and think at the same time, right? We talked about the brain, which is a parallel computer. Perhaps we model and plan simultaneously. Logan says this seems really inefficient. Inefficient how? Inefficient maybe because Shaky is doing this in a linear fashion where it would be more efficient if Shaky did this in a parallel fashion. What else? What are some other limitations here? Clearly obstacles matter. So Shaky is going to have to mod make mo uh, virtual models of the obstacles in its world. What else does it need to model in order to plan a trajectory to leave the room? Itself? Yes, exactly. So like, uh, uh, like Cog, and I, I, sorry, I realize I misspoke last time. I mentioned BabyBot. That's a different robot. Um, this is Cog, right? So Cog created a model of itself. So maybe it needs to create a model of self. Maybe that's important in order to navigate. Shaky might need to determine how big it is, right? In order to know which obstacles are actually gonna be obstacles or not. Maybe Shaky needs to model the floor in case um, there are bumps or irregularities or wires on the floor that it has to sort of figure out how to either roll over or avoid. Does it need to model light fixtures, the color of the floor, the color of the walls? What, what, what ex when does the modeling stop? Does it need to model uh, motes of dust that are filtering through the air, assuming it can see such things? If you're creating a model of the world, one of the immediate problems becomes which aspects of the world do you need to model? And obviously the more and more of your world that you model, the more inefficient you become. The more time you spend trying to determine what's in the world and less time actually acting in the world. Okay, this was the dominant paradigm in robotics for a while. 
because for a lot of researchers at that time, it felt like that was more or less what we do. As you go about your daily, your, your daily uh, life, you look around you, you sense what's out there, you try and make sense uh, you try and make sense of what you're seeing. You sort of then look inside at the model that you built in your head and determine what you're going to do next. And then you do it and then you start all over again. Feels like that's what we do. So why not make a robot that does that? In this case, when we did or when they did, it turned out that they had an extremely inefficient machine beyond just the limitations of technology at the time. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pause for a moment um, and I want to talk about um, a, a term that we're going to see many times throughout this course, which is that thinking about thinking is misleading. And I'm going to type it into chat just because this is uh, a very important concept we're going to see many times. Thinking about thinking is misleading. We sense, model, plan, and then act. It feels that way. That must be what we're doing. In parallel to the work going on in robotics and AI in the late 20th century, there was also work going on uh, in neuroscience that seemed to suggest that thinking about thinking is misleading. What it feels like we're doing or thinking or being is maybe not exactly the case. So I want to pause from our discussion of planning for a moment and talk about another component of intelligence, um, probably the most controversial one of all, which is free will. I choose what to do based on my current state and what's around me. No one else does. I am not a machine. I am different from a machine. I am different from a Bradenburg vehicle. I can freely choose what to do at any given point in time. Okay. In order to test that intuition, uh, Libet and some of his colleagues in the 1980s created an experiment which might seem a little odd to begin with, but bear with me. They invited a bunch of human subjects uh, into the lab and they instrumented each human subject uh, with EEG patches on uh, the scalp and EMG uh, sensors on the finger. What does EEG stand for? Do we have any neuroscience students uh, in the course this year? How about EMG? Most people know EMG a little bit more than EEG. It takes a little bit of typing. So electroencephalography is EEG. So this is, this is uh, a sensor that picks up uh, electrical activity. <laughs> George was close. Picks up electrical activity on the surface of the brain. So EEG has a bit of a limitation. Um, EEG is often compared to uh, MRI, which is magnetic resonance imaging. That's when you go in the big machine that has very huge magnets and it is able to detect electrical activity throughout the entire brain. There are pros and cons of MRI versus EEG, but for our purposes, we're gonna collect information from the surface of the brain, which is often good enough because a lot of the cerebral cortex or a lot of uh, conscious thought goes on in the surface parts uh, of the brain. How about EMG? I guess you can all Google this, right? So this is electro, electromyography. So myo for muscle. So this picks up uh, electrical activity given off by muscles when muscle fibers contract. So if you're wearing an EMG patch on your finger, the moment you move your finger, there'll be a spike. Uh, the, the sensor will register, the EMG sensor will register a uh, spike. Okay. Okay, so um, that's, that's the sensors. What were the human subjects asked to do? Uh, they were placed in front of a clock and on the clock they could see a moving red dot that was moving about as fast as the second hand. They were asked to freely decide at any point in time to move their finger and then move their finger. They were, when they did that, they were asked to tell the investigators at what point on the clock did you decide to do so? So as the, circ as the dot is moving around, they say, okay, maybe at uh, right at six o'clock, exactly at that point in time, and the red dot was at six, that's when I decided to move my finger. They bring in another human subject, instrument them the same way, and that subject says, okay, at 10 o'clock, 
exactly at that moment in time I chose to uh, move my finger. So far so good? Okay. Turns out that over many human subjects, um, a pattern was detected, which is that um, at about 200 milliseconds after the subject said they had chosen to move their finger, that's when their finger moved. So if someone said at six o'clock, uh, I chose to move it, uh, at six plus 200 milliseconds, they got a spike from the EMG. So at least from what the subject was saying, everything made sense. Beyond that, they noticed that there was a particular pattern for that subject that always appeared in the EEG 200 milliseconds before the muscle movement, exactly at the point in time when the subject uh, chose to move their finger. So that for each individual human subject, they did this multiple times. So if it's me, maybe I choose at 6 o'clock, then 4 o'clock, then 11 o'clock, then 4 o'clock again. I do it multiple times. And at each of those times, there was a particular pattern that showed up in my brain at, at that time, and then I moved my finger. For another subject, there was another pattern that consistently showed up whenever they reported that they had chosen to move their finger, something like, a, like um, your thumbprint, right? It's unique for each of us. So this was looking promising. It looked like the researchers were actually seeing brain activity, were seeing consistent brain activity that predicted or that correlated with self-reporting when the human subject said that they had made the decision. So far, so good. What made this experiment so famous is that 300 milliseconds before, on average 300 milliseconds, on average 300 milliseconds before the subjects thought they had made the decision, there was another EEG pattern, different from this one, that was always there 300 milliseconds before the representative pattern at the time they reported moving uh, their finger. And again, this EEG pattern here was consistent within an individual subject. So if the individual subject did this experiment multiple times, that pattern showed up 300 milliseconds always before they thought they had freely chose to make the decision. And that pattern was different for different human subjects. Okay, so that seems surprising because people felt that they were, they, when they introspected, when they looked inside, they felt as if they had made the decision at a given point in time. But this experiment said otherwise. Um, this experiment has become very famous and as you can imagine, very infamous over the years. There have been attempts to replicate this experiment, to discredit it. Um, we again, we don't have time in this course to look at all the evidence for and against this experiment, but in my professional opinion, there is much, much more evidence supporting this conclusion than uh, refuting it. There are other experiments that have shown that there are representative patterns uh, in some versions of this experiment that go back much further than 300 milliseconds, several seconds before the point at which they had decided to move. Some people argue against the Libet experiment to say, well, my unconscious made the decision. I just wasn't aware of it until this point in time, but it's still me making the decision. But if it's the unconscious part of your brain that is deciding when to move your finger, by definition, because it's unconscious, you do not freely have any control over it. You may be free to choose when to suppress ideas bubbling up from your unconscious into your conscious mind, and this is when things get complicated. Regardless, for our purposes, what it shows is that if you introspect, you think about how you do things, obviously we sense, model our world, plan, and then act. That may not actually be the case. As uh, Matt already said, we're probably not, it might feel like we look around and then plan what to do, but these things are probably going on simultaneously. The brain is a parallel uh, machine. Okay. Okay. So uh, in response to shaky, which seemed very inefficient, and in retrospect, maybe didn't seem to be like what we were actually doing, uh, Rod Brooks, who became um, one of the major pioneers in artificial intelligence research uh, from 1986 onward, um, 
Uh, part of why he became famous is because he proposed and built the subsumption architecture. So what does architecture mean here? Architecture is sort of the, archi the, the cognitive architecture. If you think of this as the brain of a robot, what are the ways in which we can cobble together uh, simple heuristics to get a robot to uh, act and react to its world efficiently? That's what subsumption was meant to do. How does subsumption work? Well, you have lower and increasingly higher levels. The lower levels are very much um, sort of survival based. These are the most important things you should attend to. If any event occurs in these lower levels, the robot should immediately react to them. So imagine we have a small Breitenberg vehicle with two wheels that's driving around in its environment and it has obstacle sensors. When we talked about uh, Breitenberg vehicles last time, we talked about heat and temp uh, temperature sensors, light sensors. You can imagine distance sensors or infrared sensors which detect distance. These are very good for detecting obstacles. If an infrared beam becomes very short, you're about to crash into something. Okay, so if uh, if the robot uh, detects uh, an obstacle on its left side, it should turn to the right and avoid the obstacle. You can think of this little pair, uh, uh, this, this sort of pair of heuristics here as a, a little Breitenberg vehicle living inside a physical wheeled robot. This Breitenberg vehicle, if this happens, takes control of the motors. This Breitenberg vehicle is in control. If the pair of obstacle sensors do not detect an obstacle, then there's no immediate danger. Um, however, if there's a slightly less dangerous signal, like hearing a loud sound off to your right, you should avoid loud sounds and turn to the left. So as long as this uh, as long as the avoid obstacle module is not in control of the motors, then higher, uh, higher components of the architecture can subsume or grab control of the motors. So if there's no immediate danger, this lets go of the motors. If there's a loud sound, these ones grab control of the motor. But as the robot is reacting to a loud sound, if there is a more urgent message from underneath, from the obstacle sensors, that the obstacle module forces higher levels to let go of the motors and the obstacle module grabs hold of the modules uh, again, uh, grabs hold of the motors. The nice thing about the subsumption architecture is it's extremely simple, much simpler than shaky. We have no complex modeling uh, of the world. We have basically two, se two sensors and two wires, like our Breitenberg vehicles connected to two motors at any given time. It's also a nice modular uh, architecture because we can keep snapping more and more complex levels on top. So maybe the robot should follow uh, light as long as there's no loud sounds or obstacles. If there's more or less uniform light in the environment, then the robot is free to just move at random, just explore your environment. We could keep adding things uh, on top. Uh, the nice thing about this is, uh, unlike Shaky, any robot that's running the subsumption archi architecture never stands still. There is always one of these modules that's controlling the motors. The motors are always sending torques, rotational forces, uh, to the motor. So you have a continuously behaving uh, robot. Um, Brooks, uh, Professor Brooks was working at MIT at the time and built the, uh, with his students built the subsumption architecture into lots of physical robots. Eventually, uh, Professor Brooks went off and founded, uh, founded the iRobot Corporation. And the iRobot Corporation ended up producing the most commercially successful robot that has ever yet been, been built or sold. What is that robot? You may have one at home. Exactly. So the subsumption architecture, for those of you that have a Roomba, and you can go try this out later today, this is what the Roomba is running. It's a version of subsumption architecture. Um, usually it moves at random, right? But in some cases, in different, it depends on your version, which Roomba you have. Uh, if it detects more dirt on one side, it might turn towards that side. So sometimes you get your Roomba circling if you spill, uh, you spill your potted plant and soil goes everywhere. It'll focus on that area. If it cleans it up, 
and there's no more dirt on one side than the other. It'll go back to moving at random. Uh, if it ever pokes its head over the top of your stairs and suddenly there is, uh, suddenly it can see down, that is the most dangerous thing to a Roomba and it will immediately turn away from the top of your stairs and keep from tumbling down, uh, down the stairs. Okay. Okay, so um, we've looked at, we've tried to illustrate this concept of embodied cognition. Um, and again, you, uh, in Breitenberg vehicles and the subsumption architecture in Roomba, the body is clearly a very important part of this process. It's not drawn here. Um, shaky, although I guess embodied, is somehow not embodied. It doesn't move very much. It stays still a lot of the time and thinks. A lot of what's going on in Shaky is inside the robot and does not have so much to do with its body and its interaction with the world. That is not true in the subsumption architecture and Roomba. Okay, so um, embodied cognition. Of course, uh, every, every algorithm uh, on the planet is ultimately housed in a physical device. So you could argue that you could argue that the apps running in your phone are embodied because the phone is a physical object that exists in the world. Uh, you have programs running inside your laptop. Your laptop is a physical device. Embodiment is not the same as physicality. In fact, you're going to be creating embodied agents in, uh, that are non-physical. They're built into a, a physics engine. Alternatively, you can have physical uh, physical algorithms or physical machines that are running algorithms like your laptop uh, or your cell phone, but they cannot use their body as a tool to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Remember that in embodied cognition, the body is a tool that the agent uses to learn about the world, like we saw uh, maybe most clearly with, uh, um, with COG last time. Okay, so uh, I just put this little cartoon here. This is not this is not an embodied agent. Here's a little uh, Lego robot. As this robot moves closer to this object, the distance grows less. And assuming that this robot can detect distance, the moment it moves, the moment it moves, you get immediate uh, you get an immediate sensory repercussion, an immediate feedback from your environment. Non-embodied technologies, even the most sophisticated uh, deep learning algorithms, they sit on a they sit in a cloud or they sit in a, st um, uh, a, a data center somewhere and they wait for data to come from them. They wait for a human to plug in a feed from YouTube or wherever the data source is coming from. Then they process and do their thing and provide a result. So they are less free to uh, learn about the world by interacting with it. Okay, a related concept to embodied cognition is the concept of situated cognition. These are sometimes confused. They're not quite the same thing. Situated cognition says the way you process information is affected by the fact that you are physically situated uh, in the world. So an agent that has sensors and is drawing information directly from the physical world is situated. A neural network that is inside a computer and waits for images to be provided by someone from outside is not situated. You're embodied if you have a physical body and you can push against the world. Okay. So um, all embedded devices are examples of situated agents or situated machines. They have a sensor. Changes in sensor readings often result in, uh, in changes in action of that device. So this all occurs in real time. Um, and changes in sensor levels are not under the control of the device or the agent. A neural network that is processing, a neural network that's processing a whole bunch of images, um, it sort of puts them in a buffer and deals with one at a time. A sensor has to deal with information coming in real time. A sensor may also buffer information, but if it doesn't do it fast enough, it might miss some information that's coming from the real world. Simple example would be like the uh, intelligent sensors in the Davis Center. Uh, in a classroom in the Davis Center, uh, if the sensor detects movement, it turns on the light. If it does not detect movement for a few minutes, turns, it turns off the light, right? So that sensor, that intelligent uh, light sensor, movement sensor in the Davis Center is situated, but it's not really embodied. 
It doesn't have a body with which to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Okay. If you have an agent, and this can be an organism, a human being, an animal, uh, a, a robot, if it's both embodied and situated, it has a body to push against the world, and it's situated, it can sense incoming sensory information, you have a complete agent. Complete in the sense that it can sense, think, act, and then act and observe sensory repercussions. It has this closed loop. Uh, throughout this course, I'll, I'll mention agents, and usually when I mention an agent, it's short form for a complete agent. Okay. Um, so if you think about complete agents, they have certain properties that other uh, agents like a, a naked uh, neural network does not have. The first one is that it's subject to the laws of physics. So my phone is also subject uh, to the laws of physics, but because it's not a complete agent, it can't exploit the fact that it's subject to the laws of physics. What do I mean by exploitation here? Um, we're going to talk in a few weeks' time about uh, bipedal walking. So we're going to talk about biomechanics. And uh, if you want to create a humanoid robot like humans, it's going to need to walk with two legs. Um, why do humans walk on two legs rather than four legs? Uh, it's, that in itself is a complex question. One answer, there are many answers to that question, one of them is that it allows human beings to exploit the physics that act on our body and exploit those physics in such a way that we are able to achieve extremely efficient locomotion. So if you're a complete agent, you can act on the world and sense the repercussions of that action and learn from that continuous loop. You can start to exploit the physics that is influencing that sensor motor loop. Um, as you walk around today, I want you to pay attention to your swing uh, your swing leg. So as you're walking, the, the foot that's on the ground that's supporting your weight, that's your stance leg or your stance foot. And the leg that's off the ground and swinging forward while you're walking, that's your swing foot or swing leg. If you focus, if you, if you focus on the muscles in your legs while you're walking, you should be able to sense that the muscles in your stance leg are tensed, which makes sense. You need to tense those muscles to keep you from falling. But the muscles in your swing leg go slack, and your leg actually mostly swings forward of its own accord. It acts like a pendulum, which means that for each of your legs, Half the time while you're walking, the muscles in that leg are getting a rest. They're relaxed. That is because evolution has figured out how to exploit the laws of physics so that we can use this passive pendulum motion to be very efficient when we walk. Children, whether they're conscious of this or not, as they're learning to walk and growing from toddlers into children and into teenagers, they're not doing that as efficiently as you and I do. Mostly subconsciously, you're learning or sensing that process and you're actually, your body and your spinal cord mostly is learning when, exactly when and how to relax your muscles during walking. You become more energy efficient at walking as you become uh, as you become older. So a complete agent is not just subject to the laws of physics, but can learn to exploit the physics acting on its body. Okay, um, as we've mentioned already, um, when you act in the world, if you're also situated, you sense the repercussions of that action, and you can exploit that fact. Can you think of some examples uh, from humans or other animals where they actually exploit the fact that they generate sensory stimulation when they move to help them do things better in the world or become more intelligent or more efficient? So the moment I move, the world changes relative to me and I can exploit Again, as an intelligent agent, I can exploit that to get better at things or do things better than if I did not sense the repercussions of my action. Any ideas? Think about all the things you've learned to do 
over your lifetime and how important it is while you're learning those things to see what actions what's generate which sensory stimulation you generate when you act in a particular way once you start to think about it basically it's sort of everything it's it's very important part of learning I'll give you I'll give you a simple example. I usually give this example when we're in class, which we're not. Um, in a big classroom with 60 of you, uh, those of you that would be sitting in the back row, most of your faces would be hidden from me because your face from my point of view in the back row is going to be occluded by students that are sitting uh, uh, towards the front of the class. So if I can't see your face, there's a simple solution, which is I move. The moment I move, relative occlusion between students sitting in the back of the class and towards the front of the class changes and I can move in a particular way to unocclude uh, whoever I can't see in the back row. It seems so obvious, uh, it might seem strange that we're even talking about it, but we don't realize that we're doing that all the time. If you're learning a musical instrument, you obviously pull the bow across the strings or plunk the keys and you hear the sound that results. And usually when you're learning, that sound is terrible or much different from your teacher or your instructor. Based on how it sounds different, that alters how you do things at the next moment uh, in time. Okay. Last important feature of Complete Agents we're gonna talk about today is when you act uh, you affect the environment, and as we just said, sometimes you sense the repercussions of those actions. What are some examples of uh, human actions that impact the environment that then becomes useful for other humans? So as you literally or figuratively move about in your world, you leave marks on the world, and those marks can often be useful for other, uh, for others. Can you think of some examples? So opening a door, absolutely, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, Ale Alexander mentions walking on snow to pat it down, right? So luckily this point in the course always comes up around this time when we have lots of snow on the ground. Uh, Siddhanth mentions hiking trails and trails. Um, I don't know how many of you are on campus at the moment, but usually at this time of year uh, on campus after a fresh snowfall, um, in the 20 minutes before the first class, suddenly trails will start to appear on campus. And those trails are typically the shortest path from the student dorms to the buildings in which classes are taught, right? Everybody's running to make their first class. So every time there's a fresh snowfall, the, the student body at UVM uh, recomputes or recreates the shortest paths between buildings on campus. You're obviously, well, I don't know, maybe you are doing it out of the goodness of your own heart. Most of us are just trying to get to class on time. So there is this unanticipated uh, effect, right? Because we're bodies, we have physical impacts on the world and other complete agents, other students can sense those and, and make use of them. There are lots of examples, uh, especially in um, the insect kingdom with ants, where collectively they impact the environment in ways that help their fellow ants. Uh, humans, unfortunately, not everything we do to the environment is good for us or other species uh, on Earth. But we can learn to create positive impacts on the environment that help uh, others. Okay, in all three cases, if you have a physical body, you can't help but be acted on by gravity. You can't help but sense repercussions of your action. You can't help but leave a literal imprint on the world. Intelligent agents are able to exploit all of those dynamics. In all the robotics experiments we're gonna see for the rest of the course, I want you to pay attention to how or whether the robot is learning or able to exploit um, the physics it creates when it interacts with its environment. Okay, so just to conclude uh, this lecture, uh, I want you to uh, think about some examples that you might put in the, uh, into this matrix here. So we'll help you understand the distinction between situatedness and embodiedness.
And you think of examples of uh, technologies, we'll focus on technologies for a moment. Um, and technologies can be algorithms and computer programs as well, anything artificially made. Some examples of disembodied and non-situated technologies. If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. So these are technologies that don't have sensors and don't have physical bodies with which they can influence the environment. What are some examples of such technologies? There's a lot of them. Microsoft Excel, okay, yep, absolutely. A chatbot, yep, good example. Uh, uh, a hand axe from 20,000 years ago is also non-embodied and non-situated. It has a body, it's physical, but it can't use that body, it's not active. It can be used by others, can be used by humans, and whether you'd count a hand axe as a technology or not is, is another argument. Cell phones, cell phones, uh, as Logan mentions, that's an interesting one, right? L cell phones, you might be able to put in another category, because why? Why do at least modern cell phones not strictly are not strictly disembodied and non-situated? What is it about modern cell phones that might convince you to move them into a different category here? They ring and vibrate exactly. So they they have minimal embodiment, but they can influence the world around them, which is usually their human owner, right? So if you have your cell phone uh, in your pocket, it can vibrate and alert you to some event going on inside the phone. So uh, in this discussion today, to keep things simple, we've talked about embodiment and situatedness as a black and white characteristic. Either a technology is or isn't embodied, is or isn't situated. But in reality, that's not quite true. Various technologies have more ways to influence the environment. Shauna mentions a flashlight, right? So there, there is a growing number of ways in which cell phones can uh, uh, act on the world. So you might consider putting them in the embodied category. What about situated? Are, are cell phones situated? Uh, as Henry mentioned, actually, they have internal sensors and GPS, right? So phones are actually also uh, situated. What are some other technologies that you might fit in these various categories? Situated and non-embodied, and embodied and non-situated, these are a little bit tricky. We've mentioned a few already, actually. How about situated, uh, how about disembodied and situated? Things that can sense the world around them, but have limited or no capability to act on the world. What are some example technologies that are situated and disembodied? So we talked about uh, a thermometer, yeah, a barometer. So sensors themselves, even, even non-electrical uh, ones like a thermometer or barometer are situated and non-embodied. Yeah, GPS tracker, right, exactly. Anything that's sort of sensor plus a little bit of electronics is situated but non-embodied. What about the converse example? What are some technologies that are embodied but non-situated? They have bodies and they can have useful impacts on the world, but they don't sense the repercussions of those actions. Or they don't need to sense the repercussions of those actions to be useful machines. This is usually the trickiest one. Microwave, yep, forklift, okay. So these are things that, yeah, these are machines that do things. As Ethan mentioned, uh, the usual one that we put in this category is industrial robots. Modern industrial robots obviously have lots and lots of sensors these days, but in the old days they didn't really need them. A factory was built in such a way that it was so structured that the robot could be confident that when it reached out with the soldering iron at exactly this point in space and at exactly this point in time that the useful work would get done. 
right? The factory would provide that for it. It didn't need to sense that case. If you're going to be an adaptive machine in this world where the world is always changing around you, you have to be situated in some way. Okay, so uh, here are just a few examples, and uh, you can probably think of your own. By computers here, I meant sort of traditional laptops and desktops uh, and so on. I put avatars uh, down here. Avatars are often situated and embodied. So if you're playing a virtual character in a, in a virtual world, in a, a computer game, that avatar has a virtual body with which it can influence the game world. And the game world is sensed by the avatar uh, in some way, in, in some games. We and every other organism on the planet is both embodied and situated in some way. And we are going to focus in this class on creating robots that are both uh, embodied and situated. Okay. Any questions about that while we switch over uh, and move into the nuts and bolts part of the course and start talking about our first important tool, which is artificial neural networks. Okay, so uh, if not, uh, let's talk a little bit about, let's talk over the next uh, 25 minutes or so about uh, artificial neural networks. Um, some of you may have already taken a neural networks course. Obviously, deep learning and neural networks are everywhere these days. You've at least heard of them. Some of you know, know them pretty well. I'm going to introduce this concept of artificial neural networks through from an embodied point of view, as always. We're going to start with our Breitenberg vehicles, and we're going to uh, we're going to equip these vehicles with increasingly sophisticated artificial neural networks to allow them to do more things. So you've already kind of seen a neural network. You can consider, for example, the aggressor, which has two light sensors and contralateral connections from those sensors to the motors as sort of the simplest possible neural network you can imagine. We have uh, two values arriving at the robot at every point in time, and those values are arriving at the input layer of the neural network. You can think about uh, two little variables that capture the values from the two sensors. Those are our two input nodes, and together those two input variables make up the input layer. Correspondingly, we have two other variables, which are going to be our output variables. And these output variables, their values are set by whichever input variables they're attached to, and they just we just copy the value into those output variables. And then the values in those output variables are sent as torques, rotational force, to turn the wheels and cause behavior. So uh, if our aggressor senses 0.6 lumens of light on its front left side, um, it's going to apply 0.6 newton tor uh, um, uh, newton meters of force of torque, which is the the um, unit for force. This one, which senses 0.9 lumens, is going to apply 0.9 newton meters of torque or rotational force to the motor. This motor is going to turn faster than this motor, and it's going to turn to the to the right. Okay. So we're going to throw away the body for a moment, and we're committing a Cartesian sin, as always. We're distinguishing between body and brain, and I apologize, but I promise we'll bring the body back soon. We can connect, uh, we can connect each of the input neurons. I'm going to start to use some neural science language here. Rather than call these input variables or input nodes, I'm going to call them input neurons. We can connect each input neuron to every output neuron in the output layer. You can see that we're starting to build a network here of nodes or neurons and edges or connections between those nodes. We're going to refer to those connections as synapses, coming again from neuroscience. A synapse is an electrochemical connection between neurons in a biological nervous system. Um, when we do, we now see that we have multiple inputs arriving at each output neuron. For now, we're just going to sum the values at the base of these arrows. So we'll go back along these arrows, collect the values, and sum them and place them in uh, the output neurons. If we were to take this network and put it back into a Breitenberg vehicle that has two light sensors, what will this robot do in the presence or absence of light? It's no longer the aggressor, and it's no longer the coward. 
This network has both contralateral connections and IPSA, same side, ipsilateral connections. How does this robot behave? It'll always move forward, right? You can see it's symmetric. So by definition, the torques being applied to both motors, it's always going to be the same. So it always moves forward. Does it always move forward at the same speed? does not move at the same speed. It depends on the amount of light. Exactly. It moves faster when there's more light, right? So the more light that, that falls on the input layer or that is captured by the input layer, the faster it goes. Uh, if it's in total darkness, both values are zero, it'll come to a stop. Okay. Let's introduce one more detail to the synapses. Um, you may have noticed in the cartoons here, there are these little plus signs next to the synapses. These are meant to represent excitatory, excitatory connections. So in the brain, there are both excitatory synapses and inhibitory uh, synapses. As the name implies, excitatory connections take the value at the base of the synapse and excite the, uh, the neuron at the, uh, at the end of the synapse. We can replace those plus signs, uh, oh sorry, if, and if you, uh, I think I mentioned this actually in the quiz, you can actually replace these pluses with minuses and then you have inhibitory connections. An inhibitory connection basically means the stronger the source neuron, the more it inhibits or decreases the value at the output layer. We'll see some examples of that uh, in a moment. Okay. So let's take uh, our pluses and minuses, throw them away and replace them with floating point values. And we'll choose these floating point values between the range minus 1.0 and plus 1.0. Doesn't really matter. I picked some values here at random. You can see we have three excitatory synapses with positive values. And we have one inhibitory uh, connection, the minus 0.3 here. Okay, so if there is 0.6 lumens falling on the front left of the robot and 0.9 lumens of light falling on the top right of the robot and the four synapses have these values, what are the values arriving at the output layer? We're going to treat these values as the weight of influence of the source neuron on the target neuron. So obviously we have the sign plus or minus uh, on the synapse, which represents whether it's an excitatory or inhibitory connection. Plus for excitatory, minus for inhibitory. The magnitude of the value represents the magnitude or the amount of weight of influence uh, on the target neuron. So how do we now compute how information flows from the input layer to the output layer? We're going to take uh, the value at the input layer, multiply it by the weight of influence, store that value temporarily in the target neuron. If there are other incoming connections, we take the value of the source neuron, multiply it by the weight of influence, and add it to the raw sum or the weighted sum that we're computing in this, uh, in this neuron. So I've just written this out for you here, and you can obviously do this with pen and paper and convince yourself that under these situations, we get 1.29 over here. We do the same thing for this second neuron over here. There are two incoming connections. So we take 0.9, multiply it by 0.3, put it in here temporarily, take 0.6, multiply it by minus 0.3, and we get whatever 0.6 times 0. minus 3 is. Whatever it is, it's a negative number. So when we add that negative number to the growing sum in here, that negative number is drawing the value down. This neuron is inhibiting this neuron. This neuron is exciting this neuron. These are extremely important concepts. These are the basic concepts that make up even today's most complex uh, neural networks. Some of you may have seen uh, last month GPT-3, which is now the most powerful chatbot in the world. For many people, it seems like it might pass the Turing test.
you can have it seems like you can have a pretty good conversation with GPT-3. GPT-3, it's got there's a lot of sophistication that goes into it, but at heart it is simply a massive neural network with a large number of neurons and synapses and at the bottommost level of GPT-3, in the engine room of GPT-3, this is what is going on. A whole bunch of uh, weighted sum calculations. Okay. You'll notice that um, I picked my synaptic values to range between plus one and minus one. And one of these output neurons has a value that's greater than one. So you c if we have more and more uh, units of the input layer, and more and more units at the output layer and we wire up every input neuron to every output neuron, you can imagine that some of these sums are going to grow uh, in magnitude. You have very, very large positive or very large negative numbers. So the last detail we're going to talk about, the, the last sort of building block of neural networks are known as activation functions. Activation functions take as input the raw sum arriving at uh, at a neuron, so if you just pay attention to this neuron for a moment, takes the raw sum, which is 1.29, and that function will then squash that value to again lie between a certain range, and you can specify what that what that range is. So in a neural network, for each neuron, we compute the weighted sum of the influences of all the incoming neurons to that neuron. Then we apply an activation function at that neuron to squash it back to uh, a, a value between a given uh, range. In this example here, so sigma stands for the uh, activation function, I'm using the threshold function, which says that if the value is less than zero, x represents the weighted sum. If uh, the weighted sum is less than zero, we're going to uh, replace the value in that output neuron with zero. If the weighted sum is between zero and one, do nothing. If the weighted sum is greater than one, uh, just put a one in there. Uh, so you'll notice that there are other kinds of activation functions, the sigmoid function, step identity. Um, some of you study um, who have studied neural networks, you might have heard there was a lot of excitement about the ReLU function uh, last year, which is the rectified uh, linear unit. It basically is the threshold logic where we just throw away the bottom half of this, uh, of this function here. It's a very simple change, but it turns out it, it made a lot of neural networks do a lot better than they would without ReLU. Go figure. Okay. Um, so in this example here, the activation function uh, that I'm using yeah, is just the, just the threshold logic. So the way to think about these pictures is the horizontal axis, x represents the weighted sum that's just been calculated. We take that weighted sum and we replace it with y, which is the rectified or the squashed uh, or the thresholded value. Okay. Any questions about that before we push on? Again, I apologize. Some of you may have heard some of this before. Okay. Um, network Neural networks are interesting for lots of reasons. Um, one of them is that they actually perform, they, uh, they perform functions, and with the right neural network, with a big enough neural network, you can approximate any function you can think of. Um, they're universal. Neural networks are universal. Universal function approximators. Um, we won't worry about that aspect of them today. We just want to see how they act as uh, how they act as functions. Let's imagine we have a relatively simple function like the one over here. We're going to assume that this is a logical function. We're going to take a neural network that has two inputs, input one and input two, and only one output. So at any given time, we can supply either a 0 or 1 to input 1 and a 0 or 1 to input 2 and compute the output. We want to create this neural network so that it computes this function, which will return a 1 only if both inputs are 1. What is this logical function, first of all? Then we'll figure out how to build it into a neural network. So this is the AND gate, right? Only if input 1 equals 1 and input 2 equals 1 will we return a 1. So we're going to try and build a neural network that computes the logical AND function. 
We're going to use, uh, we, we have to, in order to do so, well, we've already built the neural network, two inputs, one output, and just two synapses. So we need to pick three numbers. We need to pick the weight for synapse one, the weight for synapse two. We're going to use the threshold function here that will set the output to zero if the raw sum, which is x, is less than some value and we'll set it to one if it's above that same value. So we just need to put one value in here. I've made this a little bit easier by um, specifying that the weights are gonna be positive numbers. They're gonna be zero point something. Anybody have an idea about what those numbers should be? What these three numbers should be? There are multiple uh, triplets of numbers that will work. There isn't just one neural network that computes the AND function. You can actually create an infinite number. So Ben says question mark. A little tricky to start. It's a little tricky to know how to start thinking about this problem. Let's start by um, plugging in 0 and 0. So if we put 0 in here and 0 in here, we plug 0, 0 in. We want to get 0 at the output. You can probably convince yourself that if the only thing we're worrying about is this case, you can set the synaptic weights to be anything you want. Zero times anything is zero, plus zero times anything is zero. Okay, so that's fine. We can pick any numbers for here. But if we want to plug in, uh, if we now plug in zero and one, we want to get zero at the output. Does that start to guide your thinking about what the synaptic value should be here? We want to put 0 and 1 in here and we want to get 0 at the output. Let's say we put 0 0.5 in here. So 0 times, and let's say we put 0 0.5 in both of these values. 0 times 0 0.5 is 0. 1 times 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. What value do we need to put in here? I think Ben is starting to figure this out. So let, we put a, a weight of 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 in here. We put anything uh, below 1 to 0 in here. So let's put... Uh, let's put uh, 0.5 in here. Matt suggested we put 0.5 in here. So 0 times, zero times 0.5 is 0. 1 times 0.5 is 0.5. If we have 0.5 in here, 0.5 is less than or equal to our threshold of 0.5. So we get 0 back. So far, so good. We're, doing, we're batting 1,000. Uh, we've got two cases correct. If we've set these, if we set all three values to 0.5, then if we plug in 0 and 0, we get back 0. If we plug in 0 and 1, we get back 0. If we plug in 1 and 0, 1 times 0 0.5 plus 0 times 0 0.5 is uh, 0. 1 times 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is less than or equal to 0 0.5. So we put a 0 in there. 3 out of 3, correct. Let's take the last case, 1, 1. We put 1 in here and 1 in here. 1 times 0 0.5 is 0 0.5, plus 1, point, 1 plus 0.5 is 0.5. So 0 0.5 plus 0.5 is 1. The raw sum is 1 here. 1 is less than our thresh, our, the threshold we chose, which is 0 0.5. We place a 1 in there, and we're done. So 0 0.5. 0.5 and 0.5 works. You can here's another example 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0.8. That's also fine. There's lots of values that work. Okay, some of you I think are starting to get the idea. So let's look at another function. This is the uh, OR function. So now we want to set these two weights and the threshold so that if we plug in 0, 0, the network will give us back 0. And if we plug in any of the other three cases, we'll get back a 1. What should the two weights be? Synapse 1 and synapse 2. And what should the threshold value be? We need another set of three numbers. If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat.
one way to one way to one way to tackle this Matt's got the answer here one way to tackle this is to divide and conquer is to plug some uh, weights in here and then think about what you need for the threshold so if we just if we're lazy and we keep 0.5 and 0.5 like we did before forget about activation for a moment we're gonna get 0 0.5 0.5 and 1 so that means that doesn't matter as long as anything is above equal to or above 0.5 will work for the threshold value right so 0.4 that'll that'll work okay we've got five minutes left let's tackle one more function this is exclusive or exclusive or only returns a one when exactly one uh, of the inputs is one what do we need to set the two weights to and the threshold in this case to produce uh, to produce the correct answer This one is clearly more difficult. It's also a trick question. There are no real values. There are no real values that will work. George suggested zeros. If we put zero in here, zero in here, zero in here, what are we going to get? Whatever, I don't know what it is, but it isn't XOR. I guarantee you that. You can try it. The, uh, this, this realization that this network cannot compute XOR, which is a nonlinear function, we won't go into it, but AND and OR are sort of linear functions and XOR is a nonlinear function. This was one of the, uh, this was one of the things that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. This contributed to the very first uh, AI winter back in the 1980s. Neural networks were proposed, they, they were, the idea was around for a long time, but they're mostly proposed back in the early 1980s. But some other researchers very quickly pointed out they're not that good. There's certain cases where they just can't do, they can't compute certain functions. So it's wrong. Neural networks are wrong somehow. That, that thrust AI in general into an AI winter from which it only gradually recovered. And neural networks didn't recover until 30 years later, until the mid 2000s and the, be and the deep learning revolution. Turns out that you can compute, or you can create a neural network that computes the exclusive OR function, but in order to do so, you need to add an additional layer. You need to add a hidden layer made up of hidden neurons. Why are they called hidden? Because they are hidden from the real world. The input neurons somehow are getting information directly from the real world. In the case of our Breitenberg vehicles, they're sensors. And the output neurons are providing information or providing influence on the world, um, which in our case is, are torques uh, and motors. So. You have, uh, so you have this input layer, these hidden layers don't interact with the real world directly. They mediate between input and output. I've created an architecture here that, that now has two input neurons, two hidden neurons, one output neuron, um, which is a little bit bigger. It requires uh, six weights, one, two, three, four, five, six. We have three neurons that require activation, uh, require threshold values. We're gonna use the activation threshold for all three of these. You'll notice that there is not an activation function associated with the input neurons. That's normally because we just sort of want the raw information from the world. Whatever that value is, just give it to us raw and the neural network will digest it however it, it needs to. So we usually only apply activation functions to hidden neurons and output neurons. I have chosen um, to place two hidden neurons in the hidden layer. I could have placed one hidden neuron or three or a billion. I chose two to give you a hint about how to construct this uh, neural network. 
So um, we're out of time. I'll leave you to think about this. Let me just give you some strategy for thinking about this. Instead of sitting down and directly thinking about synaptic weights and uh, outputs, I want you to think about this as computing a subfunction and this neuron is computing a different subfunction, and then this neuron computes a function, which is a function of the result of this subfunction and a result of this subfunction. Divide and conquer. In order to solve XOR, you need to compute two logical subfunctions first and then combine them in a particular way. We'll uh, return to XOR and see if you came up with a solution uh, next Tuesday. You have a quiz due tonight, and you're working on assignment two, which will be due uh, this coming Monday at 11.59 p.m. Come and see me or Amanda during our office hours. Uh, have a good rest of your day and a good rest of your week. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye.